Council, please uh, take your seats. So we're going to start with the first session of the afternoon. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Jeff Manikin with the uh, uh, Meso Mesoscale Modeling Branch of EMC. Our uh, first speaker for the afternoon session uh, will be uh, Mike Farrar from MDL. Good afternoon. Uh, I've got the coveted after lunch. Uh, I'm sure the, the demand is very high. I see a half empty room. So uh, I'll go ahead and push through through these anyway, and hopefully, uh, uh, We'll go ahead and get through it on time. So uh, we'll go ahead and get started. And that's, there we go. So we're going to go, uh, we're kind of a hybrid. Uh, a lot of the folks who were talking to you earlier were themselves producing uh, things in the Inset production suite. Later on, you'll hear from customers who consume that. We, we do both. All right, so we provide, uh, we, we take the information from EMC. We also provide things in the Inset production suite to our similar users. So we're going to start off really briefly then uh, with a little bit of highlights from the last year. I'm not going to read all these to you. I'll just give you an idea of kind of the, the scope of what we're doing. The National Blended Models Project is one of the you know, higher priority um, new implementations that uh, Louis has been briefing on the Hill. Uh, while MDL is doing the lion's share of it, it is a cooperative effort with uh, OAR and uh, PSD with Tom Hamill, who's doing working with us in the QPF part. Uh, WPC has got a role and the regions are playing. Uh, it's a big effort. Uh, we have the first prototype, version one. Uh, it uh, has gone in. The implementation should be happening uh, at NCO this month. Um, on the verification side, we, in supporting of that, we did the model view, uh, blend viewer. I'm just going to go down the list here really quickly. Uh, we've had some new MOS implementations. Uh, one, which we'll talk about in some of the strategic change later, uh, we had the uh, the NAM MOS, which uh, did not get implemented due to lack of feedback. Uh, that was something that Bill LaFenta mentioned this morning, this 30-day feedback session. Uh, we'll go ahead and talk about that briefly on the last, latter slides. But that should be going in this month as well. Uh, we've got uh, the last, uh, uh, excuse me, the last GFS implementation. Uh, we were able to go ahead and get our MOS implementation in at the same time. Uh, we've got several LAMP implementations coming up as well. Um, and I mentioned the NDFD because even though it's not particular, uh, part of the NSEP production suite today, we are trying to force that over to IDP, which will be part of NSEP at some point. So it'll be, we'll be over at NSEP at some point. Some more thing with the uh, Impact Catalog, that's the new capability. Uh, the prototype is also going now in, in the IDP environment. And then the National Smart Units Project, uh, that is the, at least for the CODIS, the four CONUS regions, uh, we are nationalizing those, and it's already completed in Central Region. The other three CONUS regions are making good progress. I think all of them are at least half, half done. Those should be done in the next few weeks. So things we're working on this year, uh, same issues, uh, the same particular uh, uh, capabilities. One thing I didn't mention before is that this year on the RIP current side, uh, we are going to be working on a new forecast model in conjunction with the last it's going to be running uh, in conjunction with the NS, the uh, in, in near shore wave prediction system, also in EMC. So some of the big areas we're looking at for next year, uh, all, again, all of the same areas. Uh, the blend of models, we're going to be going into phase three. Phase two is coming later at the end of uh, fiscal year 16. Phase three, we'll kind of fill in the short range using the regional models. Uh, and so that will be the first end-to-end uh, -end, uh, national blend version that's here available for the whole forecast cycle. Um, and so those are project driven at the top. I like to focus really more on what I'm trying to do at MDL uh, strategically. So one of the biggest projects that we're working on that we're going to start this, this year and we really should be rolling in 17 is we're going to upgrade our entire post-processing infrastructure. Um, it's it was called MOS 2000. It's got the kind of retro feel like Mystery Science Theater 3000 did. Uh, it was written about 15 years ago. A lot of it is in old Fortran. It's uh, our own unique format. Uh, at the time, it was to squeeze out every byte uh, in those machines. Uh, that's really not a way to collaborate. Uh, the, the formats are not, are not standard, so it's very hard to share data. Um, so it's, uh, it was very efficient. It runs very fast, but it's very hard to maintain. It takes it's more it's uh, very user excuse me it's very uh, manpower intensive. So we're, we're we're launching a large effort right now 
to pretty much redesign and re-engineer that whole infrastructure. And one of the steps that we're doing uh, is we're working with Hendrick and Tom Hamill out at, uh, at GS, not GST, excuse me, uh, PSD, and we're going to be doing the week after AMS. We're having the NOAA post-processing workshop is going to be held here the week after AMS. So uh, that's going to help inform a lot of what we're going to do. Uh, the second thing we're doing uh, in MDL is you know, traditionally over the last 20 or 30 years, it's been uh, you know, it's by primarily uh, the MOS uh, infrastructure there. Uh, we're really trying to expand what we do uh, to uh, really focus and work more with our field units. Uh, so a lot of the innovations that are done in the field, whether it's uh, the INWS uh, that we've helped bring on to IDP or the National Smartness, we're trying to work with things in the field to help them roll them into operations. We're going to really start pushing a lot of what we're doing at MDL and we focus more on the research operations transition rather than just the things that we internally develop. And uh, finally, uh, we're going to hear, we've heard a lot about facets. There is an attempt to try to push that beyond the severe weather domain into the other 10 service areas. Uh, and we will be a big part of that as we go forward. All right, so uh, our biggest challenge, and this is kind of conforming to the template that we were asked to fill out for, for this week. So we're going to look at what are our challenges related directly to the production suite. Uh, some of this is going to kind of just standard fare. Uh, we got to take on new work uh, while we maintain our legacy products. Uh, so everybody's got to deal with that. That's just a fact of life. Uh, but we are taking on these new projects like the Spartanets and the Impacts Catalog uh, while still trying to maintain our old legacy uh, product wide. So this whole infrastructure upgrade that we're undertaking over the next couple of years will hopefully make that a lot more efficient, but it's going to be a grind for the next couple of years. Um, we've also got, uh, and we've already, you know, we're the, the tail on this dog here in terms of the the, the complexity of the inset production suites already been talked about earlier this morning. So for all these models, we do have a statistical post-processing or a MOS uh, tail end. And so the more models you have, the more you know MOS kind of things we have to do. So the simplification of the inset production suite, the model from the EMC side, actually makes our life easier as well. So we're riding on the, the coattails of what uh, Henry's doing and, and streamlining his production suite. Uh, and then the, the third bullet I already mentioned, the aging of uh, data infrastructure. Uh, we're also working with NDFD. Um, right now it's been running on an NCEP, excuse me, uh, an NCF, that's a network control facility in AOUPS. Uh, it's old hardware. Uh, in fact, it had some problems this weekend, as some of you might know. Um, that is, we're trying to transition that off of this old hardware and to build it into the IDP and AOUPS uh, baseline. Uh, that's the first step is an interim hardware upgrade. The AOUPS is going to fund, uh, it's kind of a stop gap, but once the new AWIPS contractors on board, uh, and IDP is in place. We're looking to re-engineer uh, re -engineer the NDFD part of this so it, it is much more efficient and more integrated, because right now it's kind of hanging out there on its own. Um, we've also got some state of storage issues. Uh, uh, we've got, uh, we went to NDFD two and a half kilometers. Uh, that, you know, that generated a lot more data uh, than the old, uh, the old resolution. And so we're trying to find ways to smartly archive all the data we need to have it available in real time for verification. That's one of our challenges as well. And uh, this is something more for NCO, but uh, this is more down in the, the weeds. But uh, a lot of, as we port things over to IDP, uh, there are supposed to be the same development environment as the operational environment. For the most part, that's the same. But there, is, there have been some subtle differences that have fit us. So we continue to work through that as a challenge. And we're working with NCO to work on that. Excuse me? Okay. All right. So how does this uh, help meet our, how does the question, second question they asked us was how does their production suite help us meet our challenges? And so for the most part, the things that are produced here are, we're, we're, we're partners with the with EMC. Uh, as far as some related issues on our challenges that way, uh, things we talked about earlier, the commitment to retrospectives is very important to us. Uh, we like to see that the, the the direction that we're talking about, and uh, hopefully with the, uh, as we bring on the new hardware in the next year or so, those good intent will, it will actually translate into operations. Uh, and also, uh, we've got some practices issues with, uh, with uh, NCO that we need to work through as we do a lot more of our work off of our own MDL net system uh, onto the standard systems. 
And the last one here is I know that uh, uh, DJ earlier this morning talked about uh, uh, the latest upgrade. It looks like that at least for the warm season, uh, the MOS equations for the new GFS upgrade are not really going to be a, not going to break the old equations. We haven't done that for the cold season yet. Uh, the reason we're able to that, that's important is we don't have all the retrospective drugs we need yet. Uh, and this is something we're working with EMC and the on. It's been a challenge for every implementation. So we're, that's something we'll just, we're going to continue to work as we move forward. All right, so as far as is it too much, too little, about right, uh, you get the same answer from us as you got from the UMAC. That's uh, too much, but uh, we're, 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 it's going in the right direction. Uh, and then we've got, uh, we had a nice lunchtime conversation with Jeff Craven and, and some of the AWC guys about the blend. Uh, so that's one of our related issues is uh, uh, as we move forward and a lot of the, the, the various product lines we have kind of get subsumed underneath the blend. Uh, hopefully that will alleviate some of the uh, volume of data we have to transfer. And then uh, one of the things we are concerned about on, on the quantity side is the impacts catalog. Uh, this is really, this is where the policy side that AFS is going to administer, who counts as a core partner, who's going to have an account, who can input their, uh, their, uh, uh, their, their thresholds. If that's unconstrained, this could be, this could lead to really large data volume problems. So this is something that we're going to have to keep an eye on. And then the last slide is that uh, what do we need from the models to meet our challenges? I think in the short term, this is one of the things that I've been talking with some of the field users that uh, when we briefed uh, at the NWA conference, uh, the, the, positive the positive impact we were having on our prototype of blending in the HER to our LAMP products, we were seeing uh, potentially dramatic improvements to our ceiling and visibility forecast that a LAMP was creating. Uh, unfortunately, the herd only goes to 15 hours, and the TAF period goes out to 30 for the major airports. And so we're going to use this evidence-based uh, decision-making. We're going to be looking at some of the, the uh, prototype runs that Sam Benjamin's group is already running at longer herd, and we're going to show some verification with our prototype lamp. And hopefully we're going to be able to demonstrate that a longer herd forecast can equate to much better aviation forecast. So I would very much welcome the thing I heard earlier this morning that we're going to look to, not necessarily hourly, but maybe every three hours, every six hours, have an extended her forecast. So we're going to be able to hopefully show some benefit there. And then um, one of the other things we're talking about is uh, with the retrospective runs, uh, uh, when, when Hendrick and I were visiting uh, ECMWF last year uh, on the blend, we also got a good briefing on what they were doing with their, uh, their uh, extreme forecast index, where they make really good data mining of all of their forecasts. Uh, with that, comparing it to ops throughout the whole period. So to do that, we're going to need real-time access. If we're going to actually do something like that on our side, uh, we probably will need real-time access, not off of an archive, but real-time on the operational system to all the climate data uh, that NCDC now has, uh, as well as all the retrospective data, to be able to show that this particular forecast, how it deviates or, or how extremely, or how historically significant it may be. And that's it. So I'll send in for any of your questions. Thanks. We have time for uh, maybe one quick question. Hey, Ken. Yeah, hi. My Ken Johnson, Eastern Region. Um, maybe I'll try to squeeze in two quick questions. Uh, first, you mentioned the post-processing workshop. Uh, yeah. I guess in January or something. Could you tell us more about that? Yes, it's really uh, we've been working with with EMC, with uh, the OAR lab, particularly PSD, Bob Hamill's group, uh, and then I think we have some external stakeholders coming in too, don't we? Yeah. So we're, we're really just trying to take our first steps at uh, looking at, at how we can get the. We were talking earlier today about the whole modeling infrastructure from across the, the NOAA enterprise. This is sort of this, this post-processing subset of that. Okay, and, and quickly, uh, you mentioned archiving of NDFD data. Uh, do you see MDLs having a role in uh, gridded verification? Uh, it seems like nobody really wants to latch a hold of that. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that last. Grid, gridded verification? We already do is, that. We, are, we have a verification team that already is verifying uh, the NDFD grids. 
Okay, maybe we need yeah, to we'll talk, talk later. Okay. Anything else? All right, thanks a lot. I just, just wanted to make the, the notice on the, on the workshop. Uh, uh, we started that discussion between Ezreal and NDL and EMC a little while ago because we realized that this is one of the other places where we have little itty-bitty stovepipes all over the place, and it makes more sense in some ways to have, um, at least to have the discussion to see whether EMC should be focusing on modeling and MDL should be focusing on post-processing, or do other, other completely different things still. And oh, by the way, uh, one of the things that uh, Ricky didn't put in his uh, number one notes, and I don't know if Mike mentioned that, but one of the UMAC uh, suggestions is to make <coughs> MDL part of EMC, of, uh, of uh, NCEP, so in, in order to, to make, make, make us uh, better coordinated in general. Okay, uh, we're going to move on to the uh, reports from the NCEP centers, and uh, first will be uh, Steve Weiss from SPC. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Um, this is going to be a little different than what we've done in previous years, so it should be shorter. And uh, we have specific questions, as Mike indicated, that we are asked to, uh, to provide uh, some insights to. I want to thank a number of folks uh, within SPC and particularly the Science Support Branch for their uh, continuing help with a lot of the development work and assessment that uh, we do at the SPC. So question one, what's the biggest challenges your region or center faces? And what I want to do is provide some context and just frame uh, what we are doing, where we are moving our goals, because almost four years ago to the date, there was a, a multiple-day uh, meeting that was held in Norman after the very, very uh, significant tornado season of 2011. And there were a lot of folks from the science community, the social science community, uh, communications folks, how do we do a better job? Where are we going to be going with our high impact weather uh, forecasting and services uh, that we will be providing? And this is providing, to some extent, uh, a view of where we want to go in terms of reducing loss of life, mitigating the impacts of severe weather. And this is a multidimensional problem. It's a science problem. It's a service problem. There's both physical science, which we do most of our uh, focusing on, uh, but also we're learning uh, social science factors play a big role as we attempt to communicate information about high impact weather uh, to a number of customers and users. So it really comes down to a combination of hazard prediction, risk quantification, communication issues. And this uh, helps inform and direct uh, what we're doing at the SPC and uh, provides a number of the questions and challenges that we're uh, attempting to address as well. So what are some of the biggest challenges we face? I think one of the key things is we could wrap it up into how do we effectively blend science advancements or R2O into an increasingly service-based national weather service. For example, how do we blend our expert knowledge of severe storm environments? I have storm on there twice. I must be really thinking of them. Uh, with emerging convection allowing ensemble information, this is both a forecaster and a post-processing challenge. How do we uh, bring more information to, to bear on this that complements the forecaster's ability to understand uh, and use their experience in severe weather forecasting? How do we integrate emerging, these emerging uh, convectional IR ensembles with forecaster expertise to create frequently updated probabilistic information in the short range. This, again, supports facets. Um, we're doing some internal testing at SPC. We did it in the spring for three months. We're doing it again where we're issuing four-hour tornado outlooks, probabilistic outlooks internally only at this time, but we're doing it five times a day to see can we fit this into our workload, do we have the tools to support it, and do we have any skill at doing this type of thing. What about the data volumes? We know as GOES-R comes online, as more and more ensembles, um, we're going from what could be considered a fire hose of data to a water cannon of data. We've got to do a better job in terms of post-processing and developing extraction tools. Certainly it's something that we have to work with, with MDL on and others um, to deal with this. 
how do we extend what we do in day one for individual hazards out to days two and three? Part of the challenges are associated with recurring convective storm cycles. What happens today and tonight impacts what happens tomorrow in terms of the environment evolution, and that therefore impacts what happens on day three and et cetera. So it's a cascading uh, challenge as we go from uh, the current uh, convective cycle into the next day and the next day, et cetera. And then how do we translate quantitative hazards into probabilistic impact forecasts for the user community? We're doing some focusing on that now uh, with national FEMA, but there's a lot of challenges in terms of taking a probabilistic tornado forecast and translating that into usable and actionable information that an organization such as FEMA can use. Questions two and three. I'm going to combine these because they, they are very similar in some ways to the current production suite and products adequately help you. And then is it too much, too little, or the right amount? And uh, we could call that the Goldilocks dilemma to some extent. Um, how much are we getting and how good is it? And to address this, I want to give some results of a forecaster survey we conducted within the SBC uh, a couple of months ago. In early September, we surveyed all of our forecasters, and 95% of them, 21 of 22, completed the survey. You're probably wanting to know what happened to the one who didn't do it. He's not with us, and no. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, the next day he went on several weeks of leave and didn't get to it on his leave, which he was thoroughly chastised for. Um, but we looked at a number of models and ensembles that our forecasters use in a uh, regular sense. You can see them listed there. And we also asked them some questions about potentially simplifying the modeling suite, in part due to some of the uh, issues that have been raised by the UMAC committee. So this is number one. The first question was, if the parent NAM were eliminated from operations and you were left with the GFS for guidance on pattern, environment, precipitation, et cetera, how would this impact your operational products? And on the scale, going from the left to the right, more impact as the numbers go up, and then you can see the number of forecasters. And what we wind up seeing here is about two-thirds of the forecasters at SPC said replacing the NAM at this time with the GFS would have a noticeable negative impact on their forecast. Some of the comments at the bottom, the NAM is more timely, it provides more useful information of mesoscale features, and in particular the thermodynamic profiles from the GFS, especially in the boundary layer, are often incorrect when it comes to convective forecasting. Next question, similarly if the stress were eliminated and you were left with the guess, or guidance, how would that impact your operational outlook and products? And in this particular case, you can see the distribution is skewed more to the right, and three-fourths of the forecasters said replacing stress with gaps would have a notice of negative impact at this particular time. Again, some of the common themes were timeliness and resolution better for the stress. We've done a lot of internal development of the stress for post-process and calibrated fields at SPC, and they like them quite a bit. And some of the forecasters even said, we don't look at the gaps. There isn't enough spread in the thermodynamic fields. They're not as useful as we would like. This, and then the last question, if we move, remove the parent NAM and wrap, and all that you were left with with a higher resolution NAM nest and fur, how would that impact your, guide, your products? And again, you see somewhat of a ne negative tilt. Uh, to the answers, again, two-thirds said replacing NAM and wrap with the nest or the her would have a negative impact. Part of it is related to IT and the, and the workstations because the higher resolution fields from the nest and the her take longer to load in our workstations, particularly if we want to have a national view of it. And there was also questions about some of the details in the higher resolution models of the environment information. Uh, so the, the forecasters, they can appear noisy, difficult to interpret. This is going to be a little bit different where we looked at uh, three of the deterministic models that our forecasters looked at, and we looked at them in categories of overall usefulness to severe weather forecasting, quality of the kinematic and quality of the thermodynamic field. The ratings are on the y-axis with 10 the highest rating, 1 the lowest rating. And you see here in terms of overall usefulness, ECMWF and the NAM were considered 
noticeably better by most of our forecasters uh, compared to the GFS, although there was more spread in the distribution. These box and whisker plots have the, uh, the box is the middle 50% and uh, bottom and top of the whiskers is the 10th and 90th percentile. In the kinematic fields, again, you see ECMWF and the NAM are rated better. Uh, in, in thermodynamic fields, the NAM was rated a little bit lower than the ECMWF, and again, the GFS, uh, as mentioned previously, um, was not considered to be very good for severe weather forecasting. We look at ensembles, in this case, the GAPS, the SRAF, and the ECMWF ensemble. Again, overall usefulness for severe weather, kinematic fields, and thermodynamic fields. Again, we tend to see the ECMWF and the SRAF rated higher than the GAPS, and in terms of the thermodynamic fields, the SRAF was the highest rated um, of these three models. Our forecasters tend to like the ECMWF for evaluating spread and predictability, uh, and again, the post-process fields from the SRAF are considered very useful. What about the NAM and the RAF? Even though we know these serve different purposes as far as deterministic models, with the hourly RAF providing more short-range information, the NAM more for outlook. Um, fairly similar in terms of the ratings for overall usefulness for severe weather, kinematic fields, and the thermodynamics. This, again, was the operational RAF, the NSEP RAF, and this has already been talked about in terms of the overmixing of the boundary layer in the afternoon. Um, NAM tends to go in the opposite direction and our forecasters feel the moisture and the instability is often too high. If we look at ensembles, okay, uh, overall usefulness, or these are not the ensembles, these are the convection allowing models, and clearly our forecasters seem to very much like the NSSL WARF. We've had that uh, since 2006. Um, a lot more of our forecasters look at the NSSL WARF and the NSEP PER, as well as the ESRO PER. We can see um, in the feedback numbers that there's more forecasters looking at these models than some of the other models. Uh, again, some of it is there's just too many models and that the SSEO incorporates some of the uh, deterministic runs, but they tend to feel that the NSSL war, as they describe it, is the gold standard. Uh, there are issues, again, with the HER in terms of the warm season environment. The ESRO HER will be taking care of that with the next upgrade. And then if we just line them all up and look at which ones are considered the best, and I've colorized those ones, we see a variety of ratings in through here. You can see the ones that the forecasters feel is the best. Uh, some of the key issues that they've talked about is the forecast accuracy of the thermodynamic profiles, particularly in the boundary layer. Some believe that it's even degraded over the last five years or so. Too many models, and many of them less useful makes it very difficult to keep track of them, and there's room for improvement. What do we need in terms of models or products in the next couple of years? Well, again, improved model representation of the thermodynamic profiles. Uh, documented the issues with the GFS and the GAFs and the MEG discussions, but the NAM, again, can go overboard in the other direction. We see situations where uh, the NAM may have two to 3,000 joules, and the GFS may have 500 joules of case, and those are issues that our forecasters say it's tough to deal with here. Um, we need to improve the base models, of course, if we're going to build better ensembles. What do we want to see also? Community development of an operational convection allowing ensemble. We're working closely with partners in the next screen experiment, the HWT, to be able to provide some systematic uh, comparison so we can start to answer questions about number of members, uh, single versus multi-core, uh, perturbation strategies, physics diversity, in a much more, uh, as, as Philip Hunter would say, evidence-driven way um, along these lines. And there'll be a lot of uh, participation in this, not just from different modeling uh, groups, but DTC has expressed an interest in being involved in the uh, verification and certainly the, the new MEG team that's being formed uh, will be extremely helpful. And then finally, <coughs> additional work on the rapidly updating analysis. This is not the same as the initial condition for models and something that can be used for diagnostic assessment in the short term by operational forecasters. Uh, there was a meeting on this in uh, the summer in Boulder and this uh, uh, 
really uh, discusses where the need is for an improved three-dimensional uh, rapidly updating analysis that will serve a number of users. And then what do we envision our long-term uh, model and product needs? This is the last slide here on the left. And I will be the first to admit I wear glasses. I don't have 2020 vision, so I don't know what we'll need in 2020 exactly. Um, but we foresee SPC moving down the path toward probabilistic outlooks of individual hazards to day three uh, for finer time uh, resolution uh, going out to day two, and then again, frequently updated short-term probability uh, outlooks for day one, uh, working with CPC for longer term. It's all dependent on computing capacities. And on the right are the types of attributes that we would see that would be useful to help serve SPC's needs out into the future. I'll stop here. Steve, thank you very much for that presentation. I was intrigued with the, um, the report out on those forecast or assessments of the models. You catched it in the framework of the UMAC. Um, uh, 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 finding. So I just thought I would, it seems to me that perhaps many of the differences that were reported there are, are product differences, not necessarily model core differences, that, that each one of those modeling systems that the forecasters are currently using have a different set of products and productization of the content, which isn't necessarily germane to the model itself. So I'd be a little cautious about interpreting those results as sort of cause not to execute some of the unification ideas in the UMAC report. No, I agree with you uh, precisely. We did not want to handcuff the forecasters too much in the responses that they gave. And clearly, some of their uh, responses related to the SREF versus the GEFs, while uh, they feel that the GEFs thermodynamic performance is not very good, we internally at SPC have created a number of, of post-process calibrated probabilities off the SREF for the first several days, and, and that feeds into their perception of the utility. So we're, we're very aware of that, but it's good for you to point that out. Walter Kolchinski, EMC. Have you done any model denial experiments? You mean you've gone through and asked the, the forecasters what they, how they feel their forecast would be changed, but have you actually tried to don deny the forecasters a model at a time and see how much of an impact it actually has in the forecast? No. We Perhaps in the spring anything. experiment? We haven't done that ourselves in a systematic way. We haven't wanted to necessarily go down the path of telling them what they can look at and what they can't. Uh, in some ways, they've told us what they're not looking at. In, in terms of their responses in this survey, because a number of the forecasters would say, I don't look at this model, and this is why. Um, so we received it in an indirect way, but we haven't done any type of systematic testing along those lines. Uh, Glenn White, EMC. Just two comments. One, if you see something, please report it to us. Um, you know, when you see one of these problems, please let us know. We may not be aware of it. And the second thing is, if you can keep track of the long-term performance of the model, I'm still confused myself, and I'm supposed to be keeping track of it, is when do we have a warm, dry bias? When do we have a cold, wet bias? I'm getting very confused. No, I agree with Glenn. We have seen through the years for both, uh, you can go back to the ADA model, um, what's in the NAM, what's in the GFS, some of the biases indeed do change where uh, a few years ago, the GFS had a cool wet bias in its thermodynamic profiles, and then the pendulum swung too far in the other direction. So it's not easy to make the, um, the fine tuning, and sometimes things do change. And this is something that is, is challenging for all of us, including our forecasters, to deal with, because if they think the model has a certain, a certain bias, and then they start to see something different, at first, they don't know, is this an outlier case, or has, have the performance characteristics perhaps changed? And we all need more data in order to assess that. Uh, Steve, um, in one of, your, one of your slides, you showed, you mentioned a model 
that uh, of high resolution, but the forecast of startup was very noisy. Which model was that? The her? Yeah, I think you're talking about like Cape Fields from the high res models, like the Oh yes. If we're if we're looking at the convection line models on a three or four kilometer grid, you see an awful lot of detail in some of the fields. And our forecasters are used to looking at a mesoscale environment as opposed to almost a storm scale environment where you have a number of small maxima, small minima across. It kind of looks like it has chicken pox sometimes. They do see that, but we're not using those models necessarily on a routine basis for the mesoscale environment a day or two out. What our forecasters are rating the uh, most of the convection allowing models on is their utility and their perception of convective storm development, convective storm evolution, intensity, mode, uh, that type of thing. Very short uh, comment. Uh, first of all, thanks a lot because you're doing a lot of the work that we need to do in the UMAC context to uh, to uh, uh, go towards a unified system. I, I really appreciate the effort you put in there. Uh, with that, I want to give you a challenge. Um, we like challenges, or we wouldn't be in meteorology. <laughs> oh, you could. You could. Oh, that's, okay. <laughs> that's why I'm a civil engineer. But um, the Warren forecast and the uh, RUA. Uh, it's, it's really nice to see where we're going forward. But from what I've seen so far is that that is what we're doing right now, what we're looking at is way too disconnected to what we're doing in operations already. And so I'm going to make a commitment to come out to the AWT this year, and I'm going to ask you guys to help us to figure out how to unify that before we go too far down the road and end up with a uh, completely disjoint system later on. Wow, that sounds great, Hendrik. We'd welcome you to come out. We'll give you a comfortable, comfortable chair and uh, look forward to some productive discussions. Next, we have Mark Klein from WPC. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, before I start, I just want to thank uh, several people in our branch uh, who are listed below from our forecast operations branch and development training branch for their input to this, uh, to this talk. Um, so why is this so big? Mary, that's, that's going, that's a lot, uh, there's a lot more on this slide than this. Big challenges, right? Um, Anyway, well, we're just going to press forward, but uh, basically our product suite, even though it's rather diverse, it kind of goes around three different uh, areas, QPF, winter weather, and medium range forecasting. I think our biggest challenge in the QPF area is basically high impact, heavy rainfall events that are going to lead to flash flooding. Uh, that The placement of those, the magnitude is, is definitely something uh, that's a big deal, especially in the warm season. As far as medium range, you know, our goal there is to determine the predictability and certainty of solutions. So we want a dispersive uh, long-range ensemble guidance. It's a bit under under dispersive, which I'll show in a second. Um, for winter weather, our big uh, challenges are precip type, um, snow accumulations and transition zones, and very recently we saw a good uh, issue in the upper Midwest with. Um, uh, mesoscale snow banding, uh, I think it was the November 20th storm, which uh, the models and, uh, well, nobody did very well. Um, below this is, and I'll just have to speak to it, is mining, you know, actually mining relative in, uh, relevant information from the models, um, because there is such an expansive model suite. A couple more areas that we're really going to hit, I think, a lot more later is things that were brought up in the pseudo, <coughs> just communications between forecasters and the modelers. It's, you know, what are the model biases when something new comes out? Um, how does this affect some sense of a weather element that we're looking at? Uh, and then, I, you know, we're starting with a GFS, changing something, but um, 
uh, you know, it's evaluating parallel model guidance. And I know we're moving in a different direction for that, and I am very thankful for that beyond the 30-day. But, you know, we have the retrospective runs. Now, how do we actually view them and use them? All right. Let's see what happens here. All right. Maybe this is better. We have two slides here. This is just showing the QPF, which I didn't mention, but it was written in the last slide. QPF, uh, a model improvement for the GFS and NAM, has been kind of flat uh, for the last uh, decade or more. This is just uh, showing one inch 24 hour QPF threat scores from 2003 to 2015. There's day one, two, and three. Uh, and also showing our Gipper goal. Uh, and as you can see, the day two forecasts, especially day two and three from the GFS, have gone up a bit. Uh, but overall, the day one has stayed pretty flat uh, for this period. And unfortunately, as you see, our Gipper goal has continued to rise. Uh, we started at 0.25, but now we're about 0.32 or 0.33. And while we've been able to hit this or exceed it each year, uh, there's definitely, it's going to get a little bit harder if the QPF from the models doesn't improve. Okay, just taking an example here of one of the heavy rainfall events recently, this is the Houston flooding event where there was almost 13 inches of rain in and around the Houston area. Uh, and these are 36-hour forecasts and 24-hour QPF. Uh, GFS, the magnitude's pretty good, uh, but it would have hit Dallas or the Dallas area. Uh, and then this is the NAM forecast 36 hours out, and it's just, I mean, admittedly, I picked a really tough example, but it wasn't very good. Okay, um, in the medium range, as I mentioned earlier, one of the issues we really want to see is, predict you know, we want to be able to determine the predictability and certainty of the situation. Uh, here we have what's called outside the envelope verification uh, for four months earlier this year, and I have to thank Tony Fracasso for this image. Uh, the GEFS is on the upper right, uh, the European ensembles in the uh, lower left. And basically what this is showing is a percent occurrence where the 500 millibar heights verified higher or lower than any ensemble point. So basically the max and min heights were taken uh, from each member, and this just showed that the, that the um, 500 heights didn't verify in that range. And as you see, for the GEFS, uh, basically across the southern tier of the U.S. and out to the west coast, uh, we're talking, you know, it, it did not verify in the range up to 20 to 30 percent of the time. Looking at the European ensemble, there's definitely more spread, uh, and, and the max amounts, at least in the mid-latitudes there, generally were about 10 percent, but most of the time were under 10 percent. All right, so once again, I don't know what's going on, but uh, <laughs> the tech slides have kind of gotten screwed up. So the question is, you know, is the model suite Adequate, yes, in some, in some cases, QPF uh, and our MetWatch desk have really, really, have definitely in, been using the convection allowing models a lot more, uh, including, in, and the experimental guidance, including, uh, and also the NSF cell war. Uh, that's definitely become a mainstay for both of those desks. But as I mentioned earlier, the improvement in QPF has not been good, the un under dispersiveness of the ensemble. Uh, a couple other areas where there are some challenges, uh, Precipitation type, the use of the algorithms that are there now is kind of outdated. We'd like to probably look at more probabilistic and, and also uh, actually using model explicit uh, schemes more to get the snowfall accumulation. Uh, and finally, oh, there it is, easy to digest training material. Uh, just being able, again, is there documentation that we can have that's fairly simple to bring it down to the forecaster level from whatever changes you're making and not just forecaster level, but me. Um, something that can be easily explained. You know, how does this affect that? Okay. Is the amount of data too much, too little, or the right amount? Is Steve, I, you stole my Goldilocks, but it's all right. Uh, anyway, uh, bottom line is we really think the major question isn't so much the amount, but, you know, is the quality of the guidance good enough? Is, does the current guidance allow the forecaster to make the right decision in as, in, as quick as possible? So that's really the ultimate goal here is to get the right forecast by the time you need it out there. If you are going to talk about the actual product suite, um, we kind of broadly or generally uh, are supportive of Jeff Domago's plan that he, he outlined earlier, basically having multiple ensemble systems and having the deterministic runs fall out of that. Uh, but also, I know one thing we've been clamoring, or at least forecasters have, were like, we want the high-res guidance out to at least 24 to 36 hours. Uh, that's a couple of comments I've had. All right.
right. So what do we need in the next one to two years? Well, it's kind of two areas. We need advancements in the quality of the product suite as well as post-processing. Um, in terms of the existing product suite, obviously you want to increase, improve QPF. As our role continues to evolve toward more decision support services, we need to be able to provide our partners and customers accurate information, especially for these particular events that might cause flash flooding. Um, Again, promoting greater ensemble distribution and dispersion um, in both the GEFs and the SHREF. The SHREF makes up a big part of our PQPF and probabilistic winter precipitation products. So, uh, and, and we've noticed we have a bit of an over forecast or overconfidence bias. So, an increase in the dispersion and more, you know, basically having a bigger envelope of solutions would be very helpful. Um, other improvements, uh, adding probabilistic forecasts of precip type over intervals versus the binary uh, one zero instantaneous, uh, and then also focus, uh, continue, keep focusing on land surface model improvements so we can get the situations like white rain or uh, two meter temperature, two meter dew points a little bit more accurate in those uh, wintertime situations. Um, additional post-processing, uh, I'll point out uh, something that uh, I know the SPC post processes we don't at the moment is uh, probably match mean QPF from the ensembles. Um, we also would look for bias correction uh, forecasts from, say, the high res guidance. Uh, a couple forecasters were asking about that. Medium range, I know one thing we had way back in the 90s, which I can remember, um, was the uh, ensemble clusters in the long range. And it would be good if we could bring that back in the post processing step. We are doing that kind of on our own at this point, but, it, it, but it's rather intensive. Uh, and then finally, uh, winter weather, uh, using more uh, model explicit schemes, using fraction of frozen precip and snow water equivalent, and then uh, additional probabilistic output, uh, neighborhood probability fields, we're going to be uh, going with, we're going to be starting a prototype next spring of uh, forecasting the potential for flash floods within 40 kilometers of a point. Um, and the more we found that in the uh, flash flood experiments, the SSEO, we had some post-processed uh, neighborhood probability guidance that was quite useful. So if that were possible uh, in, in the post versus us having to post-process it, that would be great. All right. Uh, what are our expected needs in the long term? Again, I think our, our focus on products is going to be more toward, we're going to continue to evolve our suite toward more probabilistic products. Uh, I think that, you know, we're looking maybe uh, to produce day eight to ten for, uh, day eight to ten forecasts, probably perhaps the operational ones for the weather service. Uh, so the real need here is good long term ensemble guidance. Um, and I think that's the main, that's one focus. The other focus, again, as I pointed out, we're going to continue to be there's definitely be an, an increased focus on, on impact-based decision support. So any tools that we can have to uh, measure the predictability um, and uncertainty of a situation which we can get convey to our partners, that's, that's, very, that's definitely what we're aiming to do. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of model output. Um, what tools can we use to synthesize this for the forecasters? Uh, this is definitely a post-processing issue, but how can we get this, how can we be able to get the forecasters the right information, visualize it for them quickly uh, because there just is so much out there. A um, couple more things, focusing uh, on the on now casting, the zero to six hour uh, range for our, uh, for our MET watch. And we even found, we even were talking about this in the winter weather uh, meeting that we had in August, is that one of the hardest forecasts is just that zero to six, six to 12 hour range where it's hard to get, where's the mesoscale band going to set up? Where's that? Um, you know, where's that heavy rain? You know, is there going to is training going to continue? Are we going to get backfilling? Uh, the models currently, the convection allowing models are great, but they don't necessarily start out so good. So things like AdStat or Nearcast, um, maybe trying to in any any way that we can fuse the ensemble guidance with with advanced remote sensing capabilities like Gozar and Himawari. Um, and finally, just coupling one of the you know. One, I know that the Wharf Hydro is coming online, um, but any additional ability to continue coupling the hydrologic models, the atmospheric models, will provide us with, with excellent, um, will at least provide us with additional flash flood uh, forecasting guidance. And I apologize for the, I don't know what happened.
but that's it. Any questions? None. Oh, hey, Glenn. Um, thank you. Um, I just wonder with this Q, with this precipitation verification, if we're essentially like we're playing dots, shrinking the size of the bullseye, you wonder why our skill isn't increasing. We've increased the resolution of these models. So we're, are we verifying on a finer and finer scale? And that's why the skill, you know, maybe the skill has increased more than your verification. Yeah. I mean, that is entirely possible. We, going back through that 12-year period, we started at a 32-kilometer resolution, um, and we're currently verifying on a 20-kilometer. So we're not verifying at the highest resolution, but we're trying. Our, our forecasts at WPC are, are created on a 20-kilometer resolution, so we upscale any of the higher resolution guidance uh, to that level, and uh, not downscale, but just remap any of the lower resolution guidance to that level. Hello? Um, uh, I don't disagree at all that the ensembles are, don't show enough spread, uh, but statistically, there should be outliers to the envelope uh, given by the uh, ensemble. There's a function of one over the n, where n is the number of ensemble members. Um, <clears throat> so you shouldn't be too surprised if you see some percentage of the actual verification showing up outside the envelope of solution. Mm -hmm. And uh, the clustering, I actually wrote the clustering algorithm way back when, in the 90s, and that disappeared, unfortunately, when there was a computer system change and was never recovered. We got that back. Oh. It's running in this ref, he says. Well, just a quick comment about the, I, I, I don't disagree, I, you, there should be outliers. The question is, um, at least, well, a couple things. One, you know, we have noticed a tendency for uh, clustering of solutions around maybe a specific dynamic core. Now, admittedly, a lot of this is discussed from the SHREF and GEFS prior to the most recent implementations. We don't have as much data, you know, with these up upgrades, so it's hard to say. But I guess the other point is, you know, should 20 or 30 percent of the forecast fall outside the envelope? That seems like you're, you're right. There should be some, and I think that the European ends in that, you know, five to seven or eight percent range uh, makes a lot more sense. With a 50-member ensemble, that's too much too. What's that? On a 50-member ensemble, that is still too much too. So that this is going back to what what Steve is saying. If the ensemble size is two and a half times bigger. It's a, it's a very coarse rule of thumb, but then you expect so many more outliers, too. Uh, just one, one really quick question uh, to see if I, I read your slides right. So extended forecast for you is up to about 10 days? What's that? Extended forecast range is up to about 10 days for you? We may be beginning to, I mean, we're looking toward uh, producing products in the day 8 to 10 forecast range, yes. Uh, I don't know the, any details or timetables or so forth. I think Dave might be able to speak a little more to that, but uh, it's definitely something that we're going to be. Okay, so that's the longer term. <laughs> with uh, with regards to the uh, uh, question about the uh, <clears throat> uh, precip scores not uh, improving uh, with time, it's possible that those are models that were are run with convective schemes, and it's possible that there are limits to how much skill can increase when you're running a convective scheme and you need to get down to the uh, models run with explicit convection to really see the gains. Okay, uh, next we have uh, Joe Sinkowitz from OPC. Okay, thank you. Uh, um, let me just uh, start uh, by acknowledging, I love this picture basically, because we are about people. That we actually have people 24-7, uh, we have 19 forecasters that basically watch over the oceans and issue warnings. 
uh, 24-7, 365. And they, they are in that picture uh, in our work area, which I happen to think is really professional looking. It looks better than it actually does. Um, so I took kind of a utilitarian approach to this. So it, it's kind of in black and white. I'm not really sure why. Maybe it was sort of the mood I was in when I was putting it together, so I apologize for that. Um, and I did it here uh, pretty uh, uh, religiously to the uh, 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 template. So challenges, okay. The first challenge that my center has basically is migrating from NAWIPS to AWIPS 2. We have been on AWIPS 2 since we left the old building for certain functions. Graphically, we are in the NAWIPS shop as are all the other national centers. Uh, we're the first center going through this migration. We have a lot of help in doing this migration. Uh, from NCO, we have uh, every other week we're on the phone with uh, uh, the uh, AWIPS 2 program office. Uh, we are in discussion, Dave Michaud was here earlier, with uh, 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 central processing. And uh, we also uh, um, are working with other centers, basically. We're not working in a, in a vacuum at all. This is a big deal. And uh, I'm actually surprised that nobody else has mentioned this. I know this is the model suite, but this is our focus. So if you look at this, you can think of, if, if having been in budget meetings and all, think of a, the AOPS2 migration as basically our must-pays and everything else is discretion. Okay, so maybe that's why I'm in black and white up there. Okay, just, just a thought. I, got, I was playing with the uh, GIS software, and just to give you an idea, and this is a challenge, our warning area alone is two and a half times the size of the CONUS. Okay? Okay. Think of it this way. If you've looked at the North Pacific in the last couple of days, okay, how'd you like to own them? It's a challenge. It's a real challenge, okay? Just to put things in perspective, okay? Just to set the tone. All right. One thing is there's always weather. Yeah, even in the summertime, uh, highs aren't quite that big compared to an ocean basin. Um, we right now do a mix of graphical and gridded production. One of the goals in our migration to AWIPS 2 is to basically merge the two so that the graphics, as much as possible, fall out of the grids. We still have to figure out how to do this on this scale efficiently so that people can act so we actually can stretch out in time. Why do we want to stretch out in time? I've got to remind you the last couple of days. Um, ships take about 20, 10 knot ship takes about 20 days to cross the Pacific, okay? Put that in perspective when we're doing five-day products. But where are we basically in the short-term climate? We're out week two somewhere, week, week three, uh, as to when they're completing their voyage. So that's a real challenge. So we basically, uh, that, anyway, that sets a requirement, basically. Um, we really do need techniques to gain efficiencies. Uh, and. Grid editing, we got a lesson this past year, and this was really uh, evident when we were dealing with Joaquin, when we had bimodal distributions as far as track possibilities. Uh, one of them, which was into the United States, was, was uh, uh, really was quite uh, uh, alarming, uh, to say the least. And we had a hurricane center track, and this is not, not uh, putting anything, this is just the way it is, that was somewhere in between. And we had other weather threats. We had a legitimate ongoing northeasterly flow that was producing surge inundation from the uh, Cape Hatteras northward up all the way up into New England. Um, so we got a little bit of a, a lesson in that, and, and we got through it, but I wouldn't say that we got through it well. Uh, and we have a sheet basically put together of lessons learned, uh, some of which still have question marks in them. Okay. Um, other things, representative guidance. In other words, does guidance actually apply directly to a product? Some does, some doesn't. And that's a challenge for us. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, an example of that might be maximum sustained winds. Uh, we use scatterometers, particularly the operational scatterometers for ocean winds from the two MEDOP satellites, the ASCAD instruments. Um, our NESDIS, there's a NESDIS team here, a winds team that's here in the building. Um, every winter and every summer, they take the NOAA P3 and do wind sampling with the traditional measurements that are available on the P3. And they have built an algorithm based on using the C-band scatterometer on ASCAP and optimizing coastal processing that was done by the group at KNMI in, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, and we think it's about the best wind product that we have available and the best representation of wind remotely sensed that we have available. 
Um, and we do see differences between our model suite, GFS uh, uh, in particular, since we're really a global model sh uh, shop, and what we see in the, uh, in the scatterometers. And they're not necessarily on the mesoscale either. They're, we're in the high impact events when there's very, very high winds, and we know the C-band scatterometer is limited when it comes to the high winds. It can see basically maybe to about 70, 75 knots, but nothing more than that. And in the tropical cyclone, the, the resolution is, is 12 and a half kilometer. You're not, you shouldn't see winds of that strength unless basically it's going through transition. Okay. Um, there are other things that, that uh, uh, represent visibility. Basically, we use here in NCEP, I think we use one algorithm in order to determine visibility. I, I think it's still the uh, uh, Warner Stillinger or Stillinger Warner uh, algorithm. We really don't have any uh, diversity that way. Um, um, anyway, that's just one example. Freezing spray, we're actually still using Overland uh, that was developed in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, a modified Overland and actually working with our Canadian colleague uh, using uh, Stalabras uh, uh, algorithm, it actually factors in humidity and, into, and also uh, waves, the effect of uh, waves. But again, that's, a, that's work that was done a very long time ago and it's just applied to, to higher resolution uh, fields. Um, and uh, lastly, is, and I'll talk a little bit more about sea ice uh, in a little bit. Um, representative products, okay, high impact focus, okay, and we are wind driven, wind and then wave. Uh, and there's, there's a direct relationship there. Um, um, our warning categories are mandated by international agreement through the WMO, uh, through the Safety Life at Sea Convention, uh, and also Marine Services Guide uh, from the WMO. Uh, so there's not a lot of flexibility there. Um, but high impact impacts vessels that are in transit. Uh, and, and our whole reason why we exist is to keep them safe. Okay. Um, and another thing representative is probabilities that reflect, reflect a future uh, threat, and that leads back into the high impact. That, that we can have guidance that basically gives us an indication of what the potential is, and then we can convey that, then that would be of real use. Um, other issues that we struggle with, user requirements, interacting with a customer base that is primarily at sea is a challenge. <laughs> interacting with a customer base that is fragmented because they're international, trying to get them all in one room or trying to get a subset of that into one room has proven to be a challenge time and time again. And that's something that we have to work at, especially as we go forward uh, in time. Um, last one is research to operations. There are bits and pieces of opportunities, but basically there isn't really a piece of OAR that is working on the issues that we have to deal with. As far as, far as uh, cyclones, basically cyclones and winds and waves. Uh, we rely in-house uh, to the marine modeling group who've done a fantastic job with the resources that they have on the wave modeling side. And uh, I, I really, it's been a, a pleasure to watch Wave Watch grow as a community model throughout the globe um, and knowing that it started here. Okay. And um, like I said, there's a limited research, uh, resource, uh, research and uh, focus on uh, marine weather parameters. Uh, which are primary mission. Okay, so does the current production suite and product adequately help you address uh, these challenges? I think on the wave side, just to answer this, uh, that, that we're fairly pleased with what we have. You know, this, we know there's room for improvement, then we know there's room for improvement in, uh, say, the onset of strong northwesterly flow off the coast. If that's been addressed. It, it probably still needs work, that the waves do not come up fast enough, the wave heights uh, do not come up fast enough. Uh, and we also know that the, on the swell side, that there's still, uh, there's been improvements that way, but there's still always room for improvement. But yes, I think it, it really does address. Um, I'd focus on winds. Uh, I already mentioned about the scatterometer winds, that uh, when it comes to the high impact event, uh, I should quantify this a little differently. The GFS of all the global models is the best reflective of what we see in the scatterometers, but it still doesn't match uh, perfectly. It tends, we tend to underpredict. The GFS tends to underpredict. Other modeling systems like the ECMWF, they do great to about 30 knots. And then when you compare the scatterometer winds with, with what we see from the ECMWF, they do not get uh, uh, reflect the strength of the, of the winds. Um, the structures are there, but the, the strength of the winds uh, are not uh, as high as even what we see in the GFS. Uh, but their wave model actually brings seas up uh, uh, faster than our own wave model. Um, 
one area, and this is a larger scale area, it's not just the high winds, but where we have a strong stratification, basically you have uh, 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 warm air over cool water, uh, say off in New England for the, uh, or anywhere north of the shelf break front, uh, then we see that typically our GFS winds are, are too strong. Uh, and um, uh, it may be a stratification that is very, very, very shallow, so it'll, it requires some PBL work, but uh, Hendrick's in the front row, and I'm going to say that uh, Hendrick it doesn't make waves. So that, that means that it's important to our customer. Okay? Um, we're, we're migrating fully to using the uh, ADA MSL uh, from the PMSL. Uh, we've learned with each upgrade in higher resolution in the uh, uh, GFS suite that we do not see a reflection in the, temp in the uh, pressure gradients uh, offshore over ocean storms. Uh, the PMSL is highly, highly smooth. And, and we've had enough discussions as to understand why the EMSL we really prefer over the oceans. It really reflects what storms look like. They're not symmetric, they're highly asymmetric. Um, and lastly, sea ice has become a critical, becoming a critical parameter as activities uh, at high latitude increase. We spent a good portion of the summer supporting our Alaska region colleagues and the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management uh, in Alaska providing them uh, information uh, uh, up to four-day forecasts for the uh, waters in the Chukchi Sea, uh, where Shell was doing uh, their operations and, and, and drilling. Uh, we learned a lot during that time, uh, and unfortunately, we didn't really were dealing with ice at that time, but, uh, uh, which is why they were drilling up there. Uh, but we know, for instance, you can book a cruise on Crystal Serenity for next August for $32,000 um, $23, for a 32-day cruise to go from Seward, Alaska to New York and not through the Panama Canal. They have a planned trip to go through the Northwest Passage. I read enough magazines, trade magazines, to know that there are hulls being built <clears throat> for sort of ecotourism to go up into the Arctic. So there is going to be more and more and more uh, traffic aside from the North uh, East Passage where it's opening up. Okay, all right, let me go on here. Okay, um, let me answer this one. This is about the available guidance, the right amount or not. We have a lot of the guidance that basically doesn't have a direct utility into our production. Forecasters may use it, but it doesn't have a direct path we don't take a product, make a decision necessarily. It's more of an option. So I'll leave it at that. And that's in part because on our inherent workflow, product design is deterministic. We know that that's a challenge and that that has to be changed over time if we're going to stretch farther out in time. But in the current state of, of uh, affairs, um, that's uh, the way it is. Okay. Um, what do we need? Uh, one to two years. Year one, we're still in the AWIPS 2, basically changing the tires while we're driving uh, migration. Okay, but we do have some things. Um, I already mentioned about the winds, uh, representative uh, and associated probabilities for winds and waves, and short term, basically out to day 10. And that would be at the two year time frame. Uh, and I will be uh, participating in the uh, uh, workshop uh, 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 that. Uh, uh, Oh, that's going to be in January. Okay, sea ice prediction capability, we're still trying to figure out who in Weather Service and NOAA is going to own the larger uh, uh, issues uh, at higher latitude. Uh, uh, and it seems logical that it would be OTC. Regardless of that, sea ice prediction and a predictive capability, and I know that they're working on the, the, the demonstration, uh, but this basically has to move along, that we need to basically uh, move forward on uh, the sea ice prediction. Uh, and coupled so that that way we have the benefit of an impact of the winds and waves of feedback into the system. And I've left out the ocean in that, I know. Um, and one thing is storm tracks. If there's a way that the traffic could be run through on the three hourly output from the models, that would benefit us uh, significantly in the, one to, in the one to two year time frame. Okay, so let me just run through this one. I'll probably stop after this. Okay, so longer term, Weather to short-term climate. I mentioned how long it takes to get across an ocean, and that basically is inherently probabilistic. Um, sea ice stretching out farther in time. Seasonal, and I say seasonal because I know from Bohm uh, uh, experience that, yes, they, they require that. They're looking at melt in anticipation, and CPC is working that. It doesn't have to be OPC. It basically is a NOAA requirement. I already talked about wind speeds uh, and uh, waves. 
from the internal time steps, unless we go to hourly output, because we've started playing with temporal composites, and you learn a lot from a temporal a series of temporal composites. Uh, um, one thing is the three hourly systems in the Pacific move very, very quickly, so that you actually, if you do a temporal composite, you'll see these pulses of higher winds. Well, they're continuous. Um, okay. Representative ocean surface currents coupled with winds and waves, um, and basically, uh, if, okay, I'll leave that there. And the last one is, is that we're still trying to figure out who is going to be like the Hurricane Center for Extratropical Storm Surge. Um, OPC basically, for all the areas and all the basins, with the exception of the Gulf of Mexico and the Florida coast, basically we have a piece of that or an interest in the marine weather side, whether it's Alaska, the west coast, uh, southeast Alaska, or the east coast of the U.S. So it seems to be illogical. That still has to be decided. But uh, we're fully aware that, that uh, as we move forward uh, and, and transition from the, the way that we're doing, we're going to be doing in the tropicals into extratropicals, that there is a piece of uh, where somebody basically has to be sitting above to help collaborate between offices. Thanks. Do we have a question or two? Joe, regarding the uh, PMSL, EMSL difference, do we know that the smoothing is not some post-processing artifact? Is it definitely the field? I, as I understand it's the way that it's derived, basically, the way that in the global model that is taken from the Gaussian grids and interpolated, basically, to, uh, to the, uh, uh, well, the grid uh, files. So, uh, yeah, I mean, they're really, really smooth. Yeah. I expect that over the terrain. I'm a little surprised over the ocean, but, but maybe I shouldn't be. Yeah, it's, re it's really a yeah. yeah. I have to retrain our forecast of what weather systems look like, to be honest with you. Other question, Joe, uh, since uh, Jeff is walking. If you talk about maximum waves, do you mean individual or do you mean maximum significant wave heights? In I'm still in the significant wave height world, even in this time frame. But I think at some point, yeah, we're going to have to talk. We already have, have seen where uh, some people are looking for NTSB, for example, is where they're looking for, uh, you know, maximum waves, basically. Well, they were actually looking for freak waves, but that's their fault. Freak waves, yeah. yeah. There's a difference between that. Anyhow, you know. Yeah. So, uh, just qu curious about your last bullet there. There's been about three presentations now that have mentioned storm surge in one way or another. What is the difficulty in uh, in this particular issue? Uh, the public really only cares about total water. I mean, they don't. I don't think really care whether it comes from tropical, extra tropical, or how it gets there. So, what what is our difficulty? What are we struggling with here? You got some ideas or opinions on that? Okay, um, I, I agree with you. I mean, water is water, wind is wind. Um, I think what we're struggling with basically is to what part of our organization has the responsibility, whether it's the Hurricane Center or another part of, of Weather Service that, that sort of sits as the glue for ETSS, um, as opposed to every coastal forecast office or even the regions. It, it, um, we were running similar models, diff different domains. Um, West Coast now, Alaska has been uh, uh, run for a period of time with, with several domains, if I remember right, and certainly East Coast. So I, I think it's more, I think it's more of a resource issue. Um, I don't, from what I saw doing with Joaquin, my office can't can't do this, can't collaborate with the resources that we have, can't cannot sit on top of this along with everything else that we're dealing with. Remember, we're a forecast office, you know, to quantify it, that we're a national center, but in reality, we're a forecast office for the oceans. So I think it's more that issue than it is a science issue. Yeah. Well, talking as a modeler, it's a science issue too. Uh, the, the, big issue, the, the big issue is that um, we do ocean modeling for the Gulf Stream is a different model than we do ocean modeling for the storm surge. And the two models are not necessarily completely compatible, which makes life rather annoying if you have to do forecasting and have two different sets of models for two different bits and pieces of the same problem. And so the storm surge, if you want to do that right, you have to go the same way that we are going with the initial wave prediction system. There are places that you 
<coughs> have to resolve uh, the bathymetry at order of a 5200 meter scale in order to do the, the storm surge, right? And then you have the prob probabilistic nature of it, where the scale of a tropical is very difficult, different from the scale of a extratropical that makes life very different. You have the fact that you want to do a depth integrated model with very high horizontal resolution to do the last piece of the storm surge, right? But if you want to do a full 3 day model everywhere offshore, and if you go to the Great Lakes, uh, it's even different because you really don't care that much about the storm surge itself. You, you care much more about the 3D uh, water quality circulation issue. So uh, there's a real science problem as well as a organizational problem with it in terms of how you deal with the bits and the pieces of it. Okay, we're going to wrap up the session with a uh, tag team uh, from AWC with uh, uh, Bruce Entwistle and uh, Ben Schwettler. So I'm, uh, I'm uh, Ben Schwedler. I'm the Cooperative Institute Aviation Weather Test Testbed uh, uh, Development Technical Lead. So uh, I, with my federal colleagues, will focus on the research to operation to uh, support a current and future aviation operations. And we are a uh, we are a global forecast center. Three of our uh, desks, three of our eight desks, focused on global operations. So we have. A warning responsibility, aviation warning responsibility for the light blue areas shown on the left up there. We also, along with uh, EMC, uh, we are working and collaborating and produce, produce global grids that are harmonized with the UK Met for uh, icing, turbulence, and convection. And then we also produce 24-hour snapshot forecasts for uh, global aviation transit uh, forecasts so that they can plan their uh, flight plan. So I, we took the approach, or I took the approach for this, to look at the challenges we have starting at observations and analysis along through the forecast suite, getting that to us, and then also providing that information to our users. Uh, the, the, I took the approach also of kind of making this presentation sort of a form of thought germ just to infect the conversation that we have here this week. And any examples that I've cherry-picked uh, have been done without re with uh, without any regard for the innocent. So uh, I, Bruce and my names are the only ones on there, so you can't blame anyone else at AWC for anything in here. Uh, one, uh, some of the challenges that we have are related to uh, the model upgrade schedule, which is something that, that many people have been talking about, and I know it's something that's going to be changing. I just want to reiterate some of the things that we have going on here, is that along with other centers and other post-processing entities, uh, we have a lot of derived products that come from these. Uh, ours focus on aviation, in route aviation hazards, uh, such as uh, icing and turbulence, as well as uh, more surface-based or near surface-based for uh, clouds and visibility. Uh, we generally don't enough, have enough time and staff to perform that full in-depth verification. It's been getting better through earlier collaborations with GSC and EMC. And this is especially important for products with multiple inputs, so multiple different solutions, whether it's multiple deterministic solutions that go into that or an ensemble solution that has an in, in built-in uh, range of solutions. And one of the things that we've heard from our users, our forecasters, and our development staff as we continue to hear this, especially from the FAA, which is one of our uh, primary customers, is that we need to have a little bit more transparency in the uh, changes that are coming down the pipe in the model suite because we have these derived products. The models will change from one year to the next. Uh, we have aviation customers that will notice why is this performing different than it was last year uh, even though you're putting out the same product that's based on it. Well, we, we try and explain to them that some of the model inputs changed from last season. It's a new version and we have some of these known biases and they may not be in the products that we're delivering to our end clients. And right now, the evaluations most often overlap and occur at the same time. We're working on uh, creating a better infrastructure on our end so it's more plug and play so that plumbing's already in place. Another one of the big challenges we have is observations. We do have satellite observations that we depend on heavily, uh, especially uh, over our global domain. The pilot reports that we get from pilots for turbulence, icing, uh, weather experiences that they have, uh, they're challenging to ver uh, verify against because we only get those at a point and at a certain amount of time, and it's not instrument-based. So one, it's subjective, and two, we're not getting them all the time. For turbulence, we are starting to get uh, more common observations 
whether it be EDR or DEVG, which is derived equivalent vertical gust and eddy, dip eddy dissipation rate. So we have a lot more of that information, which allows us to help calibrate some of the turbulence forecasts and turbulence uh, algorithms that we have. And then we also have FAA that requires observations and analysis with little to no latency. And this is a safety of flight issue. Uh, they don't want to be using something that is already outdated by the time they're uh, taking off or by the time that they're going to land. They want to have the most up-to-date observation, uh, which means that for some things, you know, it's, we really want to have the model background uh, so that we can use that for the analysis and have it in between those observation points, and we can use that to validate the models. But for their operational use, uh, they need as little latency as possible. And then uh, similar to OPC, one of our challenges right now is GEMPAC or NAWIPS. We're not currently uh, uh, the first center trying to transition to that, but we're involved in that effort. And we've, from our development staff, we've had uh, a, a large push to acquire all the data from WCOS and GRIP format. The challenge with that is there's still a lot of legacy algorithms run, both at AWC on the super supercomputer that we pull down uh, that are using that, that GEMPAC data. So that's something that we need to work uh, to tra transition forward so it's in, it's in the grid format. And then also, uh, the path to AWIPS for new products is, a, is, is a, a little bit unclear for us at this point. We had a demonstration period this year for the Collaborative Aviation Weather Statement. And because uh, GEMPAC and AWIPS is used for operational uh, production software, we uh, basically built on the capabilities that were already in GEMPAC to allow uh, forecasters to create and disseminate this product. So the path for our current production is, is a little bit unclear going forward as we move into AWIPS. So that's uh, kind of a, a high-level view of some of the challenges we face. Uh, I'm going to focus on a couple of our uh, primary development efforts in the next uh, year or two, uh, one of which is cloud visibility guidance improvement. Uh, this is on both the analysis and forecast aspect, and it's a major focus with contributions from a wide variety of people within NOAA, uh, contributions and funding from the FAA through the Aviation Weather Research Program. Uh, we've worked with the uh, Mesoscale Modeling Branch, EMC, worked with folks at GSD. They committed to providing a full 3D cloud fraction field so that, one, we're able to interrogate that fully and uh, look at the distribution and see how we can match that to observations. And then, two, also so that we can use that feedback to go back into the process to improve some of those physical parameterizations and those uh, interactions between all the different uh, processes that involve cloud. And this is key to both AWC and WFO, WFO operations. For terminal operations, for us and for WFOs. For general aviation, for us and for WFOs. For tasks, for us and for WFOs. So it's, it's, it's an all-encompassing effort. We're linking in with the digital aviation services effort through headquarters and the regions to uh, try and bring this from the forecast all the way down uh, into AWIPS and then out uh, for the public products. And uh, another effort that we have is for the World Area Forecast System. AWC and EMC make up uh, the uh, World Area Forecast System Washington, and then the UK Met makes up a World Area uh, Forecast Center for London. And we produce that global guidance uh, to support the WAF. And, uh, the move on the uh, west side is towards a multi-center ensemble, initially with the Weather Service and the UK MET models, which would give en route guidance for turbulence, icing, and convection, uh, probabilities of encountering various types of turbulence, probabilities that you'll have cloud top heights at certain levels so that they can use that uh, for uh, route planning as well as avoidance. And one of the things uh, that I wanted to reiterate that, that MDL brought up is these reforecasts that are made, uh, we need to have good uh, methods to access these so that for these uh, post-processing algorithms that we have, we're able to run them fairly easily against this uh, sample. So we're not necessarily having to pull the whole thing down from NCDC that they're available to, the, to all of us uh, so that we're able to use that same uh, data without uh, uh, wasting time uh, obtaining it, if that makes sense. Uh, we were asked whether the amount of guidance was too little, too much, or the right amount. Uh, I, from my perspective, I think that's the wrong question. Uh, I think the focus needs to be on the information that we can extract from the model suite. Because moving more into the ensemble, whether or not we condense uh, 
you know, down the number of models that we're running, as we move into the more heavily in the ensemble framework, that information is going to increase. So we have to have uh, ways to mine that properly, be able to extract information that can help us in our forecasters, that can help our customers make decisions. And one of the things that has become really clear is that post-processing for this needs to be variable specific, especially when we're bringing uh, together multiple solutions, whether it's from an ensemble or from multiple de deterministic. Example, uh, cloud base and ceiling heights, you can't really take a mean, especially if you have a bimodal distribution. Uh, OPC brought this up with the, uh, with the, with the tropical systems. It's, it's, a, it's the same problem that we have there. Um, combination also needs to be verification based, and then uh, along with uh, WPC moving to sort of neighborhood probabilities, some of the, some of the fields in the initial HREF uh, were, were primarily point based, which weren't as useful as they, they could be uh, because of the uh, uh, characteristic of the field. Uh, we also have the issue of when we're uh, trying to uh, query the models where different resolutions or different uh, or different um, grids will have a different parameter set than this. I know that some of this is intentional for, for data rates, but it becomes a challenge when uh, we want to apply uh, algorithms to uh, like a full 3D parameter set, and it's only available in a lower resolution and not at the, at the uh, native model output. And then we need these 3D, uh, 3D fields so that we can develop these. Um, I wanted to just touch on the run length versus update frequency, kind of the model run cycle. I tried to do this without mentioning any uh, specific models, but uh, the tap period for major airports is, goes out to 30 hours. So we need output out to at least 36 hours hourly so that we can uh, have that with the model latency that it takes to run that for that full period. Uh, there's also the issue that the GRMet, which is our primary uh, advisory product, and the TAF issuances, the primary ones, are offset by three hours. I know that there are uh, more rapidly updating TAFs out there. But so it's on a three and a six hour cycle. So we do need these longer range runs going out running every three or six hours. And uh, some of the feedback that we've gotten, especially from FAA this year since we moved uh, one of our uh, convective products from being uh, drawn by a forecaster to taking model or multiple uh, model solutions and combining them is that with that hourly updating run, sometimes the solution vacillates or can change drastically from uh, the previous two hours that was issued. And that's something that, that uh, we've heard quite a bit of feedback from FAA and the decision makers there that um, some of it is probably subjective because they're used to it being uh, uh, given by the forecaster, uh, but it's something that we'll need to consider as we go forward with this. And those frequent runs don't need to go out as long uh, because uh, we can have those uh, longer runs that happen at a uh, lower update. Um, some initial thoughts on production suite of, uh, evolution. Uh, we need to continue to focus on the physics improvements. Uh, vertical resolution increases have been helpful, so we need to keep looking at that as well in addition to the horizontal resolution. And then increased collaboration between global and mesoscale is required. Uh, we've been working a lot, whether it be with GSD or EMC, on the mesoscale side on various physics uh, changes and improvements so that the uh, solutions that we need or, or the parameters that we need are improved. And that needs to feed back into the, the global as well. Um, and then also the output, if we do move down a path of merging them, because that's been brought up a couple of different times, uh, we need to have those parameters and the, and the science needs to be there the same between the two. And then some longer needs that we have as we'll be moving towards decision support services. Uh, so we need to bring all of, the, uh, all of the centers that are serving aviation, us, uh, WFOs and CWSUs together, uh, and have one of the things that has been very helpful for the FAA is, is some of the tools that have been developed by private industry have a rapidly updating verification so that they, you can give an idea of how well it's performing today. So that's kind of something that would be helpful as we move towards decision support services. Uh, services. And this also needs to integrate with the FAA tools. So uh, with that, I uh, stand between uh, you and break. Uh, so I'll take questions at this point. Um, John Hewn, Miter Kazdi. 
uh, McLean, Virginia. Um, ben, just a, a quick question for you. It's not really directed at you, but maybe more towards the weather service in general. So in, in speaking in terms of some of the models used for decision support on the FAA side, um, I'll specifically bring up um, the short range ensemble forecast. So we've heard from some of the users that they would prefer to have the lag time uh, reduced. Do you know if there's any effort uh, to you know, do sort of any capital improvements uh, along those lines? By lag time, you mean time that's available from uh, model initialization time? Yeah, so instead of it taking four hours, you know, maybe it takes two hours. I think the users would be happy with that as opposed to a, you know, a couple of points uh, increase. Um, my notes are, are filled with um, you know, improvements to resolution, which is going to be great. It's going to move a lot of our decision support tool development work fast forward. But I haven't heard much today on uh, lag time improvements. So maybe that was you know, implied in some of the improvements, but I didn't pick up on it. Yeah, I don't know that I can speak to that point specifically, um, but I know that that has been brought up by uh, some of our other users as well. Um, this may be a non-question, but <clears throat> if it is, that's just been out of the loop uh, too much. Whatever happened to NextGen, the 4D cube? Don't hear about that at all. In so there's a, a larger uh, weather service NOAA effort. Uh, it's now called uh, NextGen IT Web Services. And uh, I believe it's running now on the IDP development system and is feeding uh, the FAA Tech Center. Uh, so that is still in uh, development. The, the concept of it has changed or, or a little uh, in that right now it's mostly focused on the data delivery side instead of the single authoritative source aspect of uh, NextGen. Uh, but that's, that's where it currently is right now. And actually one of our, one of our developers at AWC is the uh, national program manager for that. So we're, we're, we're quite plugged into getting that information to the FAA using the Open Geospatial uh, Standard format. This is Tom Hamill. Uh, may I ask a question? Go ahead. So uh, I'm interested in your requirements for retrospective forecasts for a lot of the variables that we consider, surface temperature and precipitation. It seems to me that it's not a tremendous amount to archive those fields, but when we're considering aviation icing and turbulence and cloud decks and things like that, it seems like we may need to archive data at a fairly high vertical resolution. And I'm, I'm curious about, is that a correct assumption? If we produce retrospective forecasts, do we need to make those available on disk? Temperature, winds, humidity, uh, you know, uh, cloud, information on a very high vertical resolution, or can you accept some sort of compromise? Uh, that is a very correct assumption. Ideally, we would like to have all of that, so, uh, especially because some of the uh, plans for the World Area Forecast System, right now the output is on one and a quarter degree, and the goal within the next six years, I believe now, is to try and get that down to a quarter degree at least at disseminating. So that is a, 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 a very important thing to be able to have the, the vertical information for the parameters that we need so that we can uh, encapsulate the whole uh, range where those hazards exist for in route of flights. Do you have a sense of where you might be willing to make compromises? Uh, do you not need information above 40,000 feet? Do you only really care about flight level data, not so much getting up to flight level, or do you really need everything? I'll uh, try and take that back to some of the developers that uh, are working on that now and see if we can, uh, and, and our international branch chief as well, and see if we can come up with a, uh, a, a position or an opinion on what, what would be the first things to go and what we really need to, need to have. Okay. I'd also invite you, uh, Mike Ferrer mentioned this post-processing workshop, and I'll send you a message inviting you to that because we would be, be very interested in these aviation requirements for post-processing. 
Yeah, that'd be, that'd be great. And if I can't go, I'll make sure we get it to the right people. Thank you. Okay, a uh, reminder to please use the Google Google form to get your questions for the Ask the Branch Chief uh, session tomorrow morning in. Uh, break begins now, and we'll meet back here for the final session of the afternoon at 3.30.